So Professor Prince is um, is the director of the Bioinformatics Institute in Molecular Medicine and, and Pathology, which is in Medical Sciences in the Faculty of Medical and Health Science. Um, so Professor uh, Print got a medical degree first at the University of Auckland, uh, followed by a PhD. Um, and then he spent some time doing postdoctoral fellowships in Australia, as well as um, at Cambridge University in the Department of Pathology. Um, uh, after, at which point he was a fellow of um, St. Edmund's College. He returned to New Zealand in September 2005, um, has brought interest in bioinformatics to improve understanding of um, pathology. Um, he uh, is interested in, in education of medical students as well. Um, I saw that he's, he's given 20 invited talks on the application of bioinformatics uh, to medicine. And I'm not sure if this is um, out of date or not, but it says that you, you still have students and collaborators in the UK that you're still involved with. Oh, I need to update my website, I think. <laughs> okay, but in the, in the spirit of collaboration, um, uh, Professor Friend has been um, involved in many different countries with, um, with fields that, that bridge many different disciplines. So we're excited to, to have you. Turn it over. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I feel quite humbled because I've always looked up to the ABI as these people who I'm slightly scared of because they can do all the maths that I can't quite do but can almost reach. But for me, this is the main joy of collaborating with the Auckland Bioengineering Institute in that people are able to reach out to me and tolerate my amateur mathematics and my amateur modeling and help me to do some really cool things. So what I would like to talk about today is really collaboration with people in the ABI and some of the potentials for this from my point of view as a bioinformatician. So I'm going to start off by um, talking about my ideas of collaboration which are going to be probably a little bit different than some of the others before a very quick introduction into what I mean by my field of bioinformatics. And then I want to throw out some challenges that may well be things I'd be delighted if you say, no, we've solved that, that's all nailed down already. But I'm not sure the challenges I want to throw out necessarily are. I want to talk about moving much more solidly from DNA sequence, RNA expression, up to the physio. Can DNA and RNA really be part of multiscale models and really make a useful contribution to predictive models? And then I want to talk a little bit about the clinical use of integrated multiscale information that goes right back to DNA and RNA before I conclude with a few ideas for discussion about opportunities. So first of all, this is my view of collaboration, and some of you will have seen this before. This is my favourite analogy for collaboration. A group of guys doing something really cool where every single one of them is doing it perfectly. And this is what it's like in every project in my research group, by the way. <laughs> so isn't that a cool analogy? I think that's what collaboration should be about. It should be a joyous interaction where everyone <coughs> does their part really well and where there's probably 20 or 30 rehearsals of that and failed attempts and the joy of collaborating until everyone lines up and it does well. So I see for me as a bioinformatician, fantastic opportunities for collaboration with the ABI. My main collaborators there have been Edmund Crampen, who a few years ago left for Melbourne, and several of you in the audience who work in the, in the areas of systems biology that can reach through to gene expression. But as you'll, I hope you'll see from what I say, I think collaborations go well beyond that in their potential. So my area of bioinformatics, just to remind you what it is, obviously modern biological data is becoming massive in scale. When I did my PhD, I cloned a gene and I was the first to discover that gene. I was probably one of the last generations of people who can do that. And I slowly worked through sequencing context to build up the sequence of that gene. And I thought that was big data, but it's really tiny data. This is a um, picture up here of just 3,000 base pairs. This is a picture of gene expression profiles. This is some work from Joe Kirsten's when he was in the ABI in a collaboration with Paul Nielsen and Edmund Crampin and Mark Jacobs and others. 
generating biophysical models where he looked at the expression of different forms of proteins over time in the skin. All of this is fantastic stuff, but it's meaningless as data. And on its own, it doesn't have much value until we distill the information out of it. And that's what I think bioinformatics is. The distilling of information out from biological data. It doesn't have to be genomic data, it can be birdsong data or protein data or structure data. Bioinformatics is driven by technology, like much of the work that you guys do, and this is a min-ion sequencer that plugs into the USB port of your laptop. You've probably seen these. We're using these quite a lot in the lab to try and map structural variants now in um, cancer genomes, and we've just started to try and do quite a major program doing that, but obviously they're also designed for use in the field. This is the latest one from the same company. This is an iPhone here, and this is the little sequencer that plugs into the bottom of your iPhone. The sort of scenario you're out wandering in the bush and you see a tree, you don't know what it is. Sequence the bloody thing. It's, it's a brand new world with this type of technology, and the ability to apply this to the sort of work that all of us do in the room, I think is quite fantastic. But of course, it just produces data, and without the distilling of the information out of that data, it's meaningless, it has no value. And that's where I see collaborations being really exciting. This is just to remind me that it obviously goes well beyond bioinformatics. This is a fantastic project. I really enjoyed being involved in with Joe Kersons, Rod Dunbar, who spoke earlier, and several PIs from the ABI. And the idea there was to try and link the physical structural gradients of different, um, the expression of different phosphorylated forms of this signaling network with calcium gradients to really understand the development of the skin. So we've got amazing technologies to measure DNA, to measure RNA abundance, to measure the structural gradients of proteins and their phosphorylated forms. But I think we're still catching up to those technologies. And in my personal view, the critical limitation or bottleneck in what I do day to day remains an incomplete molecular understanding of normal function and how that normal function is disrupted in disease. So we often, talk in my research group of the technologies still racing ahead of the scientific understanding. And I think, for me, this is the most exciting part of collaborations and potentially with the ABI to try and bridge that gap and help the scientific understanding catch up through better distilling of real information from big genomic and physical data. So now I want to throw out a few challenges that you may tell me are not challenges at all and actually are really easy. Uh, I hope you can, but they're things that I've really struggled with for a few years in collaboration with bioengineering folk. The first challenges I want to talk to you about and raise for discussion, and hopefully I'll get some feedback and I'll learn something from this, is that gap between DNA sequence, RNA expression, and the physio. So this is a sort of the data we often have. We've often got data about a phenotype or a physical process, in this case the program death of um, cells called endothelial cells. So we can record over time hundreds of these cells as they die by this process of program death or apoptosis. We know exactly what genes are turned on at what point. We have dynamic profiles through this process. The, this uh, video sped up about 100 times, and you can see the times if you're near the front on the bottom of these graphs, where sets of genes are actually turned on and off as part of the genetic program that's involved in the cells committing suicide in the body, apoptosis, when they're no longer needed. But then this whole process is influenced by DNA sequence. There is a whole range of over a thousand different polymorphisms that change the dynamics of both the physical process and change the dynamics of RNA expression throughout this process. Some of the polymorphisms or differences in sequence don't seem to alter the dynamics of gene expression or protein expression or metabolite expression or um, glycome expression at all. 
they just seem to directly, through some other mechanism, alter the dynamics of the phenotype we can measure. So presumably they're causing a change in protein structure which can function in a slightly different way that's never reflected in the abundance of different species of molecule. How can we put all this information together much better to link in with the physio? Obviously there's probably no better place in the world to try and do this than what I regard as one of the centres of the physio but also a centre in the University of Auckland that's very good at generating and understanding and distilling information out from the data. So we've worked with Edmund Crampin and others in the ABI for about 10 years to try and better generate models to understand the combinations of mainly gene expression data but also genetic variant data and phenotype data and how to bring them together. This is uh, Edmund and Daniel Hurley and this is a very nice paper that we published together trying to bring together an ensemble of different types of gene network models to summarise or distill information out of gene expression data of different types. When we started to combine that with some methods developed by my collaborators in Tokyo, which used massively parallel supercomputers to allow us to look across the whole genome and estimate gene networks, finally that started to become really exciting. And then when we combined that again with better methods to build transcription factor and target networks and link this in with DNA expression information and with mutation or genetic variant information, finally got that got really exciting. So each of these little steps has helped us make models that on real world data seem to be more and more predictive. But the residual between the models and what's really going on is still massive. These models are still relatively poor. We keep trying to add different things to the models such as microRNAs or long non-coding RNAs but none of them really have nailed it for us and I think this is a fascinating area for iterative development. This is a model of that process endothelial salapatosis in um, CSML, a language many of you know is, has some similarities to CellML from Satoru Miyano's group in uh, Tokyo. And to me this model uh, illustrates some of the really exciting but problematic areas in this. I'd love to be able to have a model that could predict what happens next to a cell like that endothelial cell you saw the picture of dying. I'd like to know what's going on inside the cell molecularly and in a biophysical sense. But this, these models can't quite do that. I think the major problem is we simply haven't developed good ways to fully parameterize these models with the sort of data we can generate. There's so much missing data that isn't in the models, but we can probably gather. So how do you really put this sort of data that we can gather now into this sort of model effectively? I'm hoping that you've got some really good answers for that, and I'd love to collaborate to try and do that. So here are a few big questions, well, they're big questions to me, and they may be relatively trivial questions to you, I hope. The first is, can we use gene expression networks or some form of model based on gene expression information along with biophysical information and perhaps genetic variant information to build more predictive physio models that are very useful for us. Secondly, how can we take information about genetic variants and see how they propagate through a multi-scale series of models? Obviously we know that a single genetic variant has caused me to potentially have green eyes and you not to have green eyes. That's a major phenotypic difference that has propagated through all sorts of layers of molecular networks inside a cell, tissues, up to what is a phenotype in me as an organism. How can we allow these variants to propagate through models? Or actually is this just too hard? Is there some strong inference in here that we can never model, things we can't predict from the constituent parts? Is there a lot of stochasticity here that's just the random way that we develop or that our cells work? And is this just too hard to even attempt? Are we wasting our time? How could we tell if we're wasting our time? Are there ways that we can estimate that? 
And most importantly for me, how do we actually know when we're right? It's great to generate a beautiful network diagram or a beautiful picture like this. I'm really proud of being part of this. I think it's way cool. But we don't really know what it means. And I think just simulations or matching keg, that sort of thing, the day's really gone for that, hasn't it? Karl Popper, the scientific philosopher, had this touchstone that a theory isn't considered scientific unless it's falsifiable. So how can you try to, to prove false a model like this? Maybe with our whole gene technologies now, we can measure every component of this model and disrupt multiple components one by one, and perhaps this sort of model can really be tested. Maybe we can do multiple disruptions in as many ways as we can and have a look at that. I'm not sure, but I'd love to talk to you about that. Second potential challenge, the clinical use of integrated multi-scale models. And this is an area where I'm very much coming from the genomics and bioinformatics and clinical side rather than the modeling side. And, but I, nevertheless, I think it's an exciting area that I hope could be an area of collaboration. This is uh, Leroy Hood, who's visited Auckland several times. He's a real friend of Auckland University. He's also a real doyen of systems biology. And about five years ago, he said that in 10 years' time, we'll have billions of data points on each individual patient. So we've only got five years to go, and it's not going to be each patient, but on many patients, I think he's, he's correct. So that, that really, I think, raises the question, how do you distill real information from those billions of bits of data. So the data becomes valuable. And we've had a number of collaborations here that actually started off with um, insights gained from models that were built in collaboration with Auckland Bioengineering Institute people. This is one example where in breast cancer, some women's breast tumors are addicted to estrogen and estrogens are produced in a large amount and these tumours need the estrogen signalling inside each of the tumour cells to survive. Currently there's immunohistochemistry, you know, protein detection methods used to detect the estrogen receptor on the surface of the cells which directs whether a woman should receive an estrogen inhibiting therapy or not. But we've recently published a paper a couple of weeks ago talking about a more systematic model that looks at the signaling pathways downstream of the estrogen receptor in these cells, which we believe could potentially give a better stratification or potentially a better um, decision for women and their doctors about whether a anti-estrogen therapy could be useful and also potentially help us understand hormone receptor pathways in tumours better. And that really came from ABI work initially. This is another example of work in neuroendocrine tumours we're doing, where we're trying to use a range of systems biology models to understand the impact of loss of heterozygosity. So often in tumours, you'll get whole chromosomes that are lost. And of course, you'll lose, if you lose one copy of a chromosome, then the two alleles you had, one from your mother, one from your father, there'll only be one left. There are many of us contain large numbers of single allele mutations which aren't mean for us, meaningful for us clinically because we've got a remaining normal allele that can compensate for a bad allele. But what happens if in a cancer you lose a whole chromosome, you lose your remaining normal allele, you've only got the bad allele there that can drive a tumour. And we've been using systems biology models to look at the effect of mutations in genes, for example, like ATM, which reduce the function or increase the function of that particular gene or pathway and systematically turn on a pathway that can lead to tumour growth. One of the National Science Challenges that I'm involved in, National Science Challenge 3, has a fascinating project to try and get as much information as possible out of blood by sequencing the blood and then later on by using a whole raft of technologies to look at whatever we can pull out of blood that is relevant for cancer. And the idea is to take the diagnosis, the idea that we sold to the National Science Challenge, we tried to sell, was to take the diagnosis from the hospital out on the hill, potentially out to a marae or an isolated community. And we've made a good start on this. This is a very big field internationally. 
we now can easily detect mutations of some tumours in blood, but probably not all. We can detect RNA expression patterns associated with particular cancers, and I think this is a, a rich area for collaboration and growth. Leroy Hood, who I showed a couple of slides ago, has a major program trying to do a non-invasive approach to systems biology very similar to this. So I just wanted to, in conclusion, talk about what I see as some really nice opportunities based on current initiatives. Obviously we've got the various centres of research excellence, the cores, we've got the national science challenges, there are a lot of HRC partnership funds that we all try and access all the time. But I think in Auckland there are some very specific opportunities for funding collaborations. First of all, as you're probably aware, um, MB put out a call for a proposal last year for a large genomics research platform. And this advanced genomics platform replaces or will replace what is currently known as New Zealand Genomics Limited. It's a second phase or a step on from there. And in many of the submitted projects that may potentially, we hope, be funded by this, there were there was the opportunity for systems medicine or systems biology and medicine to play a major role. So we do hope that this proceeds in a way where collaborations with the ABI and systematic or integrated analysis of pathways can be part of the genomics. Orion Health, of course, has its precision-driven health initiative. I think this provides fantastic opportunities for clinical data to be used in a really comprehensive way in electronic health records alongside genomic data or other data. I'm chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Auckland Regional Tissue Bank, and this is a relatively new initiative built on some previous tissue banks that we want to expand very quickly. I think there's amazing opportunities for using tissues and genomic data linked to them, clinical data linked to them, for systematic analysis of disease. We've just recently had awarded to us a strategic research infrastructure fund initiative from the university, which works in the Auckland Academic Health Alliance. It's called Genomics into Medicine. I think that's another brilliant opportunity for collaboration. We have around $70,000 a year in collaborative research funding that could go along the, along the way to generating pilot data or pilot projects that potentially involve the Auckland Bioengineering Institute that use genomics in something very productive related to patients. So I think from this side of things for me there are several really exciting potential research questions. Can gene network models based on multiple data types be used in individual patients to much better stratify therapy than is, is done at present? Can profiling of blood with a whole range of molecular markers, including DNA sequencing of blood, gene expression, metabolites, proteins, and so on, be used in a more integrated fashion where we build models based on this rather than looking at individual molecules one at a time? And can biobanks of clinical data and potentially genomic data and maybe physical measurement of tissues, can, can they contribute to collaborations? In 2013, we had an initiative funded by the Faculty of Science called the um, Initiative for Complex Biological Systems. This cost about $100,000. We brought Leroy Hood across to speak at a symposium where people presented ideas for funding. And these were ideas that came between a computational person and a biologist. And this, I think, was a moderately successful initiative. And I'd love to see something else like this. Is this a good time to try and generate something like that that went across the university but was potentially co-led by the ABI? I'd be very excited if that sort of thing could see research. So I think there's real opportunities for collaboration involving bioinformatics with the ABI, and I'm very grateful to have a chance to talk to you. Thank you.
a good amount of time for some uh, questions and answers and discussion for potential collaboration opportunities and uh, even some potential funding opportunities, which I thought was really nice to highlight that towards the end. Um, Chris, a fantastic talk. I mean, great challenges you've thrown out to us. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is for the, the issue of linking the learning transcriptional level, level data to physio and mental cells, tissues, organs, etc., is to have just one example of a system where we've got enough data at different levels. So I'd be reasonably confident that the the models could be put together, but it absolutely depends on you know, to have value and to be able to possibly to really understand whether there's something um, that the models are doing a good job. We, we absolutely need to have the data at the multiple levels to be able to validate the program. So, so I, I would throw the challenge back to you a little bit to say, what is the model system? provide us with that multi-scale data that we could really have a good kind of linking the genetic level to the large scale as well. Mm. Well, I guess one of the obvious starting points may be cardiomyocytes, given the amount of work that has been done on modelling various aspects of heart tissue at the tissue and organ and cellular level. I think that there are a number of processes that could potentially contribute, and I'm not really sure how they fit into physio models, but processes such as inflammation or apoptosis are very easy to gather the genetic and genomic data because we can combine static with time course information to what I think allows us to build much more solid or infer much more uh, predictive uh, networks of different molecular types. But where I get a bit lost is how you start to combine that at a, a dy dynamic process, say like inflammation, how you start to combine that into models of tissues and then organs and organisms. And this is where I'm way out of my depth. So, sounds like a conversation with a then perhaps the gene expression information bypasses that. But increasingly we now realise that the epigenetic modulation, like methylation or microRNAs, have a massive effect on the splice variants of RNAs that are then translated into different protein isoforms, for example. And I, I suspect that's going to be a much more important area than we have to thought. I still believe regulation of these transcription may be the first to model and then cut down the residuals by looking at the epigenetics. Yeah, well, what's your view on that? Well, I, I, my sense is that um, it, just, just looking at a, at a larger level, if you've got to actually have some mechanism that you're going to take all the way through to prediction, while combined with both that genetic input as well as the epigenetic
choices. Uh, I was thinking you could think of an example that so didn't bring in good things. <laughs> I, uh, I just looked at the, the Twitter feed for the, the research forum, and it sounds like there's some interest in getting a portable DNA sequencer to have a DAVI. So definitely some interest in that. As well as someone commenting that uh, drowning in data and trying to find information is, is definitely something that resonates with, with many of us. So um, thank you very much for, for the talk and for coming out.